on? Oh, you're gonna, I've got, we're kind of doing a hybrid thing. So if we have some, <laughs> we're trying to entertain like the virtual world and y'all. So um, Emma's gonna be helping with the virtual part. If you guys online have issues with audio or whatever, just stick it in the chat so Emma can know. If you guys have issues with my audio, <laughs> let me know. Um, also, hey Randall. So hey, I'm Jess Wilson. I am the president of Southeast Tennessee Young Farmers Coalition. Um, welcome. And just a few like housekeeping things. Um, we're gonna do the presentation in here. When permitting, we're gonna lay out food in here afterward. And then we're gonna, we have the outdoor space and the indoor space. Um, so hopefully the rain holds off and we can eat outside. And then if it's still nice and hot and people are wanting to go swimming, we will drive down to the river and go swimming after that. Um, so hopefully that'll all work out. Um, I'm gonna have to say yes to this for a minute, got it. Okay, so if you are new to our group, um, or even if you're not, we would love to have your name on our sign-up sheet um, to let us know you're here and put your email in there if you wanna be on our email list. Um, that we do have some also some just information out about the National Young Farmers Coalition, um, including a Finding Farmland Calculator link, um, which is a tool that the national organization has, um, which we were discussing earlier. I have not actually tried it. So you can tell me how you feel about it once you try it. Um, so our chapter is a local chapter of the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, we serve kind of greater Chattanooga area um, but we're also the only chapter currently in Tennessee. So we are very open to, you know, helping to get other chapters started in the state, but also just allying ourselves with other similar organizations, especially when it comes to policy. Um, we're a policy organization and we're interested in doing state level policy work. And we feel like in order to do that effectively, we really want to have a larger coalition of organizations across the state. Um, so we are Southeast Tennessee. We also you know, have members from Alabama and Georgia. Um, it can get a little tricky with thinking about the name and what we actually cover. Um, what we do, we, we have some projects going on. We have quarterly meetings. Um, we are about creating a community of support for young farmers in our area. Um, we would love to have you involved in whatever way you wanna be involved as a member um, or just as a friend or an ally. So just be in touch. And if you have any questions afterward, please feel free to reach out to me or to Emma. Emma is our project coordinator. I should also, I guess, mention, um, we have a few other board members here. Um, Kelsey Keener, who is helping to host this event, um, is on our leadership team as well as Randall. Tomlinson. Um, who else am I missing? I think that's all that's here. Melanie, <laughs> thank you. Melanie Lust from Crabtree. Um, myself, Matt Sparatio is, um, if he's either going to come online or he's going to be a little late getting here, um, is on our leadership team. Scout Miracle is on our leadership team. Who am I forgetting? Richie. Um, way is on our leadership team that's it <laughs> um so we're happy to have you here and also as you're thinking about how you want to be involved if you're like gosh i would like to be on that leadership team you know <laughs> let us know we're happy we really want to have new i mean we got a lot of good energy on there right now but <laughs> new energy is always welcome um so let us know about that so i'm going to introduce <laughs> we're not going to introduce all these people but i am going to bring Emma Chapman, our project coordinator, up because she's been working on putting this together and she will introduce our speaker. All right. Hi, everyone. Okay, they can see me up there. You can all definitely see me. Um, so, welcome. It's great to see everyone and to have other people being able to attend virtually. This is our first hybrid event. So, we're really testing our limits of technical knowledge and you guys are patient with us. We appreciate it. Um, the presentation is going to be 30 to 45 minutes, and we're going to try to save all of our questions until the end. There will be a lot of time for discussion, and we hope that afterwards when we share a meal, we'll continue to have um, 
So before we jump in, I just want to introduce you all to Christina Rossovilla. She's our presenter. Um, she is the communications and social media manager at Burner Trust. Um, she also owns and operates Villa Acres, uh, which is an organic and biodynamic farm. Um, they have veggies, eggs, and blood. Um, she has seven years of farming experience, and she also just enjoys sharing photos and stories and information to help uh, change human habits and mindsets, uh, causing food system climate and overall well-being for all time. So that's a, an amazing perspective to bring today. We're really excited to have you here. Um, we're excited for you to give us a deep dive into the Rarian Trust and all that we're doing to keep and get land into the hands of farmers. Um, welcome, Christina. Hey everybody, thank you so much for having me today. It's really an honor to get to be here with you all. And I am so excited to tell you about the amazing work that Agrarian Trust is doing and that I get to be a part of. So it's really exciting. So yeah, as Emma shared, um, I have a farm with my partner, Anthony, and it is called Villa Acres. And we just want to acknowledge that we farm on land that is the ancestral territory of the Cherokee, Choctaw, and Shawnee people. And that if you all are interested in finding out more about whose land you're on, you could go to Native Land Net. Um, they have a great map and a lot of information. And I always just like to show that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I work at the Grand Trust on the national staff. And then I also get to be on some local Grand Commons boards. So I represent Middle Tennessee Grand Commons, the Vermont Grand Commons, and then also the Puget Sound Grand Commons in Washington. Okay, off to a great start. <laughs> How do I change the PowerPoint from here? Or you can change it for me if you can do it from there. Um, Sorry, everyone online. <laughs> this is one of the things. I think just click. Maybe it wasn't a hard okay. that first. Okay. Farmland is in crisis. Every single day, 2,000 acres are lost from agriculture production. Every single day, 37 mid-sized farms close, buckling under the financial burdens and pressures of this unsustainable system. The earth is being depleted, overextracted. The climate crisis is imminent, yet less than 3% of farms across the nation are actually using regenerative and organic practices. Over half of all US farmers are over 75 years old, and often their retirement is tied to the land that they own. Land prices have skyrocketed, keeping many young, new, beginning, and socially disadvantaged farmers out of land ownership entirely. When land goes on the market, it's the highest bidder who gets it. That's usually developers, speculators, investors, wealthy people who want big private lawns, not the kind of people who are growing food for their communities using ecologically sound methods. It is predicted in the next decade, over 400 million acres are going to change hands. Who has access to that land? How that land is held and transitioned matters now more than ever. Agrarian Trust is a new organization with an innovative path forward to help fill the gaps needed so that aging farmers can retire with dignity and so that emerging farmers can have access to land without financial barriers locking them out. We're living in a system that is not working, but Agrarian Trust is finding ways to work within that system to protect farmland and to support next generation farmers. Agrarian Trust is doing this through a variety of initiatives, one of which is Faith Lands, which is working to connect and inspire faith communities to use their land in new ways to promote land and human health, food and farming, and enact reparative justice while strengthening communities. I brought a few of our Faith Lands toolkits with us. They're on this back table if you would all like to look at that after the presentation. We're also doing this through the Commons Alliance, which is a network of community centered and land based organizations, land stewards, service providers and community members dedicated to creating solutions to the most pressing land questions of our time. And we're also doing this through the Agrarian Commons, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. 
These are nationally supported, community held land and agrarian property that supports sustainable food production, ecological stewardship, community vitality, and equitable land access for the next generation of farmers and ranchers. Agrarian trust is decommodifying land by taking land off of the market permanently and putting it in the hands and control and ownership of local communities called the agrarian commons. So the National Land Trust of Agrarian Trust is the parent organization. And then there are all of these local agrarian commons that are set up as C2 land holding entities. These land holding entities have boards that run them. And these boards are comprised of three different parts. One third farmers, the people who are actually stewarding and caring for the land, one third community stakeholders. And these are the people who eat from that land, who support that land. And one third agrarian trust staff representation. The board is structured this way to ensure that the decisions that are made about this land in this community are made by the people who are impacted by this land in this community. So the agrarian commons owns the land and then they lease it out to farmers. While that is legally what's happening, this lease is nothing like a normal lease that you've heard of before. There are many things that make the agrarian commons lease drastically different than a standard market lease. One of those things is the cost. So the agrarian commons board gets to decide what the cost is going to be for the annual lease that the farmer is going to pay. And if you remember, the farmer also sits on that board that makes the decision. So the farmer is part of getting to decide how much their annual lease is going to be. This cost is always far below market value, absolutely not extractive. Any money that is paid into this lease stays in that local agrarian commons and does not go back to the national organization. To give you an example, in some places, the agrarian commons lease holders are paying $0 a year. In some places, they're paying $2,000 a year. In some places, they've agreed and worked in a land reparations payment to the local indigenous tribes whose land that they're on. Another thing that makes the agrarian commons lease so different and unique is the duration of time that the lease is for. So where a typical lease is normally one year, three if you're lucky, this lease is for as long as the state will allow, which here in Tennessee is 99 years, giving farmers incredible security and tenure, making it so that you can dig deep roots, build communities, plant perennials, build soil structure, and know that you're going to have that for the years and years to come. Another aspect is the rights of nature, which is just so cool. <laughs> so in this lease, nature is thought of as a participant in the lease, because nature's rights should matter, because the environment should matter, because we should care what we're doing to the soil and the waters and the environment that we're living in. Before I go into equity, I just wanna share briefly that the leases are also available on the website. And so if you're interested in seeing a lease in real time that's being used right now across the country, you can select an agrarian commons on the website at the agrariantrust.org website and go to the structure tab and pull up the actual lease that's in practice right now. So one of the greatest things about the agrarian commons lease is the equity building component. So in this lease, farmers can build equity in the similar ways as they would with a mortgage, but also in additional ways. So they can build equity through making lease payments in. They can also build equity through soil improvement, through infrastructure improvement, through perennials, through things that we all think are important as farmers, but that developers and speculators and the normal real estate market do not take into account. These leases are also transferable to children and the next generation if they also want to continue to farm. So for example, just to show you all in practice how this sort of thing works, the equity component. A farmer enters into a lease for, say in Tennessee, 99 years, but 50 years down the road, they decide they don't want to be farming on this agrarian commons property anymore. So they sell the lease 
And then they cash back out all of the payments that they've made, any equity that they've built through soil improvement, equity, equity that they've built through infrastructure improvement, any buildings that they've built on the land, anything like cement flooring or any improvements to the infrastructure gets to be cashed out at the end. And then the next generation farmer does not have to start from the beginning. They don't have to start from scratch. And that is one of the beauty points of this entire model is that it is allowing farmland to be transitioned without being lost. Although the National Agrarian Trust does not dictate what happens to all of the land in the local agrarian commons, there's one main rule that does come down from the national organization. And that is the land must be used for chemical free food production agriculture. And that's really what we all want anyway. <laughs> communities need farms and farms need communities. And Agrarian Trust is bringing both of these people to the table, creating more just and resilient food systems throughout the country. When we take out the money, the for-profit drive, when we break down the financial barriers, we're able to focus on land and people and build healthy, resilient food systems. This is a map of where we have agrarian commons so far. And this all just started a little over two years ago. So in just a little over two years, this is how much has happened. And now I can't wait to tell you a little bit more about some of the projects that are, have happened and that are in the works. But first, I just want to back up kind of zoom out a little bit and tell you the ways that agrarian trust is so uniquely different than typical land trusts. So conservation land trusts have been around for about 100 years, starting with the trustees of reservations. Um, and what they do is typically use the tool of a conservation easement. There has been a lot of great work that has been done by conservation easements and by conservation land trusts but they are limited in what they can do. And right now, at the crux of all of these various crises that we are in, we need to be doing more. A conservation easement restricts the actions that can take place on the land. For example, no logging, no CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, no feedlots. But it does not say what will happen to that land. It does not ensure chemical free food production agriculture. It also does not remove the land from the market. That means even once a conservation easement is placed on a piece of land, it is still only available to the highest bidder, the people with the most resources, not young farmers, not socially disadvantaged farmers. Also with a conservation land trust, their decisions are made from the top down, not by the people who are impacted and living with that land not by the community who should be holding that land. Community land trusts have not been around as long. They started with new communities land trusts in Georgia in the mid 1900s. Community land trusts are wonderful in many, many ways and how they do keep things affordable off the market, their local governance structure, but they're limited in scope. They normally and typically focus on buildings, housing, infrastructure. They don't typically work on agriculture land. They also unfortunately lack the national support that so many conservation land trusts have access to. They're very often excluded from federal funding. So agrarian trust has been born out of the very best of both of these other types of land trusts pulling from it the pieces that are working and are a good way forward and combining them into something completely new and different. It's really exciting. <laughs> so just to, this just shows what I just shared, but basically the key differences between agrarian trust and the other land trusts are the mission, legal structure, governance, ownership, equity, protection, and stewardship. So now I've given you the rundown. And now I just want to tell you about the exciting work and the amazing transformation that we've seen in such a short amount of time and what land can do for people and what it can do for communities. 
This is now Black Seed Agroecological Farm. This was the very first land ever gifted into the agrarian commons. Ms. Caroline Gardner donated 10 acres of just hay land. And as the board's responsibility in the agrarian commons, one of their responsibilities is to find next leaseholder. So this board put out a request for proposals, received applications, and then landed on this group that centers BIPOC control of food supply, is run by women, is run by Muslims, is run by Black people, and it is amazing what has already happened. Having land access, having land security is something that these people have never been given before. It's something that they've never had access to before. I can't wait to see what happens in the next several years there. Little Juba Central Maine Agrarian Commons was the very first land project that we fundraised to acquire land for. This group of people were struggling to gain land security. They had found leases, they had found land, they were growing their own food, and every year or so, they were kicked off of the land that they were growing food on. People did not want to rent. People did not want to keep them around. They shared that it was racism, that they had a hard time entering into legal agreements with mostly white landowners because white, oh, white oh, people own most of the land in this country. More than 90% of the land is owned by white people right now. So Agrarian Trust partnered with them, worked out the legal side, secured this 200 acre farm. And now the leaseholder is the Somali Bantu Community Association, which has over 200 families growing food for themselves and for their communities, making a living and building health and wealth in that community by having land security at affordable rates. Children visit, school field trips visit. The level of food, um, food stamp usage in that community has dropped dramatically. There has been so much vitality, so much positive growth there. Just recently completed a remediation project in Massachusetts for an indigenous collective of women and two-spirit people. Like all land in this country, this land was stolen from them. And to be able to be part of remediating that land and seeing them get to be part of their land again to grow food on that land, to do ceremony on that land, to wild harvest on that land. It's amazing. It's really beautiful. This project was the most recent project. All of the work of Agrarian Trust focuses on some sort of justice aspect, social justice, land justice. This project was mainly a land justice project. West Virginia has been extracted from for as long as this country has been around. The coal mining, mountaintop removal, it's exploited. This project we agreed to move forward on, started fundraising for. These people were farming there already, growing food for their community. And then, I don't know if you all heard, but there's a new national park right down the street from it called the New River National Gorge. In the process of fundraising for this, developers came in and tried to develop this farm, tried to acquire this farm for development to build hotels and restaurants for this new national park that's right down the street. This farm was going to be developed and Agrarian Trust was able to step in, save this farm, and now this woman-led community farm is pumping out more food than you can possibly imagine. They have school tours, they feed and bring in their vegetables to the schools. The cafeterias get to use that food, that nutritious, organically grown food to feed children. This is the future that we want. This is an example of the kind of way that we should be moving forward. Right now, we're working on two different projects in Virginia. Both of them are focused on acquiring urban farmland for black farmers. In one of the locations, this farmer has not had land security for over five years and instead has been borrowing neighbors' lawns 
and piecing together enough land to be running a sustainable farm business for over five years now. Right now, he's growing food on a five acre plot that we are fundraising for. We're hoping to secure it by the end of the year and it is already creating such transformation in this community. School buses drive by, airplanes fly right over it, landing at the airport right next to the farm. The other project in Virginia is right outside of Richmond, right next to an elementary school that serves over 90% BIPOC students. These children have never seen food growing. This town does not have green space. Imagine what this is going to do for these children to even know or be aware that food grows out of the ground and that that's what you can be eating. These projects are high impact. They're making a big difference. Are we okay on time? I would love to show a video. Okay. So we have this uh, five, six minute video that we put together and it's focused on the Central Virginia Grand Commons. And I think it's a really great overview of some of the transformation and some of the impact that these projects are having. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that and I hope it's okay on Zoom. <laughs> Just type in the chat if you can't hear on the audio. When you grow up in the city, you don't really have a reference point to see firsthand and experience firsthand how food makes it to your table. It has not been a normal aspect of our city life experience for probably 60, 70 years. I was born into a military family, we lived on and around military bases, so I did not come from a landed family. My family had no land. It's assumed that if you're Black, you came from an urban area in the modern world, because there was a time if you were Black, it was assumed you came from a rural area, but that changed post-Civil War. Particularly Black and Brown people are faced with high concentration poverty, you know, public health issues, all types of challenges and social inequities. And the work we do around developing green spaces, I consider this a liberation work. We're losing 30,000 acres of land every year, we meaning African-American community, and we now own less land collectively than we did in the year 1935. Like, how do we level the playing field for folks that grew up in poverty? My father bought this land in 1968. All of my life, he grew a garden, and my mom put us to work in it and had us picking and shelling and all that sort of thing. Cattle farming, that was my dad's thing. When we heard the Agrarian Trust presentation, and they emphasized the injustices toward Black ownership of land, Dan and I thought, oh, we don't have children. There's nobody we have to lead the land too. And lo and behold, maybe like five, maybe six months later, Callie Walker decided to donate 80 acres to the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons and said, hey, I want to make sure that this land goes into black and brown farmer hands. The development of this piece of land to serve as an incubator for people of color who wish to come out and learn about agriculture, that's the real takeaway gift here. And we hope to develop it into a self sustaining, vibrant community. We want to work on a whole farm to consumer network with two to five or seven farming businesses that are doing complementary things. With the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons, we aspire to connect people to both rural land as well as urban land. By acquiring land in the urban space, we can use that land for folks to be trained and learn to get their chops and then move on to larger parcels of property. You know, it's, it's not just something that we just do. It's we understand why we're doing it and the significance of people who look like me is break the chains. And one of the last vestiges of that is being chained to food systems that you're not included in. That's why agriculture is the game changer. I don't have a 
firm answer to the question of how does a person or a household figure out when they're taking too much of the Earth's resources and somebody else is bound to suffer. But the sense that to whom much is given, much is required, that has taken a deep root in me. Uh, and I really want to live into dispersing the resources that I've been given and trading them off, I hope, for a form of extended family. I feel like this is the way that we charge up new generations to appreciate farmers, to become farmers. I see it happening in real time, just how community members are empowered by having access to land. We're not worried about a developer coming in with an offer and being like, yo, you got to go. Like, no, we can take root. That's what I'm hoping we'll be able to build here and show by example that a community can really be built up and operated by people of color that are successful in agricultural ventures and live sustainably so that five generations from now, when I'm gone, that this place can still be standing and people can still be learning here. So we're going to work to see, can we make that happen? You could think that donating land means you're just giving away everything that you have. But what I really feel like I'm doing is I'm trading it for near neighbors who are growing food, who care about the masses of humanity, who are taking on the social causes. Uh, I'm trading it for the world's best neighbors. We're on the cusp of showing the world what can be done when organizations understand their positionality. The Agrarian Trust shows up as a collaborator to help create these liberation strategies for communities that have been marginalized. And that's the type of work that we need to be doing right now. Hype about it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that video so much. <laughs> It has over a thousand videos or views on YouTube, and I think all. Hi, of folks. We don't know each other, but if you found this video, it means you're looking. I'm just kidding, <laughs> but yeah, I just want to say Natalie helped us put that video together, so thank you, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons is founded on BIPOC control of land, and those are things that each Agrarian Commons board members get to decide. So each Agrarian Commons decides what their bylaws specifically are going to be, what their focuses are going to be, what their regional the area that they're going to uh, focus on are gonna be. So all of those things are held at the local level also. So for an update on Middle Tennessee, oh, sorry. Yes, an update on Tennessee projects. This is actually the very first public announcement. So you heard it here first. We are going to be working in, later this year to start fundraising to acquire Jeff Poppins Long Hungry Creek Farm so that he can retire because he deserves to be able to do that. And so that his land can be saved and protected and carried on. And so that the entire farm that he's worked his entire life to build can not be lost and can be of use to next generation farmers for years and years to come. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, we are in talks with other organizations and other potential landowners, but none of them are far enough along to share publicly now, but definitely if you want to talk later, I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> 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 so, uh, how to get involved. So, I really want to encourage you all to go to the Agrarian Trust website. We are working to update it every day. There is so much information there about every individual Agrarian Commons. You could spend hours and hours just on one individual Agrarian Commons about all the press that has come out about Agrarian Trust, about each individual Agrarian Commons. There's an entire video, podcast, uh, lecture page that you could just deep dive on and spend so much time on. Also, if you want to sign up, Letter, that's a great way to stay in touch about, you know, what the news is, what's been going on, what's happening, but also land opportunities will be shared first through newsletter and then also social media. Please follow us on any of your favorite social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it, we do it. So follow us so that you know when there is a land opportunity and what's going on. But for other ways to get involved, obviously a land donation 
is always welcome. And that that is how this is going to keep going. If we have to buy every farm, it's just not going to work. We need people to be aligned with this vision and have the same goals and see the need for this. Farmers looking for land. We are very into having conversations. We do very often. We wanna hear about what your interests are, what your goals are, what you're trying to do, what community support you already have, what partnerships you already have, and to see if there is any way for us to get to work together. So please reach out my card my cards, there's a stack of them back there on the table with the Save Lands toolkits. Um, definitely reach out, like let's talk, let's see how we can work together and be involved and stay connected. Partnerships and collaborations, if you have a local business or any sort of way that you can think about teaming up to continue this good work together so that our audiences can become the same so that we can support the work that each other are doing, we would love to talk about that too. So please reach out about any of those things. If you're a person of faith, or if you know someone who is, please check out Faithlands. That's a section on the Agrarian Trust website. And like I mentioned several times now, I brought some Faithlands toolkits. That's a really, really great way to be connecting other people who have access to land that's not on the public market already. And that is all I have. And now if we would like to have any questions. Christina, just a real, like, if someone does have a question, can you just repeat it into the microphone? Oh, yeah, I'll repeat any question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll repeat any question. I have a question. <laughs> um, so we get a lot of, like, as our being the local young farmers chapter and trying to figure out what our role is, like, we get a lot of questions, and we kind of feel like we're in this role to make connections. Like, that's the thing that we have. And I probably should be talking to the microphone, right? Um, and so, I don't know that. Um, so, you know, we're happy to work with you, but also I'm curious what the capacity is of agrarian trust. Like, I feel like there's so many people looking for land. Yeah. There's so many pieces of land on the market. Like, how do you get them off the market? Yeah. Um, how do you acquire them in the first place if it's not donation? Um, how do we, like, do you all organize people to do the fundraising? Like, how do you do that fundraising piece? And like, how many farms can you get in the hands of farmers? Like, what is the capacity and how yeah. can we help to grow that? I guess. Whoa. <laughs> Those are a lot of questions. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot. Sorry. Yeah, so Grand Trust is a really small organization. And um, I definitely want to encourage you on the Grand Trust website, there's an FAQ frequently asked question section that answers basically every question that you just <laughs> asked. So definitely dive into that. But we are a really small organization and any land project that would come forward that would be a large fundraising land acquisition project would be at least three years out from right now. We have a lot of them in the queue already that there's already been a lot of back end work on to build out. And so, yeah, usually we focus on projects that have a lot of community support already. So that are deeply engaged in the community that have a lot of people that support that farm and that, you know, or a farmer in the case of the one I was sharing with you who had just like piecing together the lawns, you know, that person had built a lot of community support. Um, so yeah, definitely check out the FAQ section. I'm sorry, that was so much now I'm having a hard time remembering. Was there something else specifically that you wanted to ask? Well, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, I feel like what Agrarian Trust is doing could also be replicated by definitely like conservation land trusts. Definitely. Right? I love what you just asked. <laughs> so that's what a grain trust is doing could absolutely be replicated. In fact, we've worked with Vermont Law School to put together an agrarian commons toolkit. Thank you so much for asking this question. Oh my gosh. All of the resources that you would need to start in a grand commons are available online. The lease template, all of the foundational bylaw documents, everything that you need. And that is the hope we know as a small organization, we're not gonna be able to do it all, but we're hoping to be a model so that other people can see how to do it and that they can carry the work forward. Because what we need is not just a couple of people working on this, everybody needs to be working on this. This is a crisis. <laughs> Sorry, I feel very passionate, but I actually talk about agrarian trust all the time. So the fact that you all wanted to come here and just listen to me talk about this is fabulous. <laughs> Are there any other questions? 
And then if you have any on, uh, if anyone on Zoom has a question. Yeah. So taking the, um, the plot that you guys are planning on buying in this area as an example, uh, how many acres is that? And how many people would that be split up? If I, like, if I wanted to farm on that, would I yeah. come to you and say, I want 10 acres or would yeah. you decide that? Those are, that is a great question. So would I decide that? As an agrarian trust staff person, I would not, but I just happen to be on the Middle Tennessee board also. So yes, I would get to help decide that, but just want to like clarify that. But um, so this farm that we just shared about, uh, Jeff Poppins Long Hungry Creek Farm, he's also known as a barefoot farmer. That's like a more familiar term, but uh, his farm is 250 acres total. And um, this is a situation where it's like partial, like they are aligned in their values and principles and we're not buying it for market value, but it is more than enough for him to be able to retire with dignity and like the amount that he should be able to retire. As far as your question about who will be farming that land, Jeff Poppin is still capable and loves farming and he will be farming that land until he no longer wants to. So he'll be the initial leaseholder. After that, when it's time to find a new farmer, the Agrarian Commons Board will either help support that or Jeff will have someone who naturally becomes a farmer anyway. So in many cases, I mean, the farmer on like has many generations of farmers that just naturally are the obvious next generation farmer. It's only when there's not an obvious next generation farmer that the board steps in and helps to locate one. And so as far as your question about how many farmers, yeah, 250 acres is definitely enough to support multiple farmers. And so I am not gonna say right here, right now that that would happen, but that could happen. In like in the case of the land donation that we watched the video on, the, as you heard them say, they're interested in having between four and six farmers or farm couples or farm families on that farm. So multiple farmers per piece of land. Yes, absolutely. If that's what they want to. <laughs> okay, just to be clear, the board makes that decision. I want to say say something. Yeah. Wrap up, but just want to make sure there's no other. Do you have another question? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, well, this PowerPoint in that YouTube link be available uh, to you. Um, I, I could email the PowerPoint definitely, but the YouTube video. So Agrarian Trust has a YouTube channel, and this video is on that YouTube channel. If you just type Agrarian Trust, you'll find the YouTube channel. You'll find this video and a lot of other awesome, super fun, inspiring, exciting videos also. So like for instance, there's one about the West Virginia Grand Commons that we just watched or that I just told you about. And um, yeah, definitely check out the YouTube channel. And then, okay. This is like, I don't know, um, in the connecting the commons with the farmers, is there anything in place that the agrarian trust as for um, like logistics, like delivery, like getting like the produce to the common. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you asked that question too. I actually had thought about how to include this in the PowerPoint, but I was like, I'm just gonna, I'll table that. Okay. So each agrarian commons is set up to hold between four and 12 farms. And that is so that farms can start to share resources and connect better as a network. So most small farms can't afford things like you just brought up a refrigerated truck, or like I think about often a CPA tax accountant. Like, but if four farms banded together, then we could all afford to pitch in for one of those that we all use at different times. So yes, definitely that is the hope and goal. Um, so all of the agrarian commons currently are only holding one farmland but they are to grow to hold between four and twelve so that resources can be shared yeah thank you yeah <laughs> um well you talked about like the national support that the common boards have from a your interest as a national team and i'm wondering you know as a as an agrarian common specific common group like what types of resources like what types of things does, does that board that they yeah. fund as opposed to like if they're a board of the farm, like what are the types of things that the farmers would need to do individually versus the board would step in? Yeah, that's a good question. So so um 
money comes into each of Grand Commons boards in two different ways. One would be the upfront fundraising, and then the second would be through lease revenue. And then, of course, if someone just wants to donate, of course, to that. Then so that's three ways. So then, what happens to that money? Is your question? Yeah. So. The board decides that, but typically those things would be infrastructure improvements in, and then I'll share some examples of how those money or that money has been used in various agrarian commons throughout the country, which would be um, pollinator habitats, um, soil building and restoration, and then of course infrastructure improvements, uh, building out buildings that are just old and dilapidated on farmland. Um, office buildings to agrarian commons are using that money for office creating office spaces right now wash stations and those are just examples that are happening but yeah in general that money would typically go to things like soil restoration pollinator habitats but all things that benefit that farmland and that farmer specifically in commons models that you have now i'm just curious what percentage of the board on the common side are restaurants and like I don't know. Okay. I'm curious like who makes up the, the commons. But um I don't I don't know if there are people, but the idea is it's not just farmland being held. Right. It's that it's agrarian properties also. So like like businesses that aggregate food, just the other pieces of land and property that support a food system. So it could be a restaurant, definitely. Um, and they're actually in this project we'll be doing in Tennessee, that farm project does include a restaurant building space. So that is definitely a good point. Thank you. Like people have to eat somewhere. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you all so much. And yeah, I think my boss is watching. So you guys mind just being like, yeah, you did awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am gonna open. No, I guess this video is on. Yeah. Okay, it's just hidden. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, I did have one <laughs> one last question. I so I feel like we often get people who are like, "Hey, I have a couple acres. Um, I have this old home place. How can I, you know?" And we would love to get them in touch with you. But I'm curious, like. The idea of like starting our own, you know, agrarian commons. At what point do you know that that's like? What's the first thing? Is it like someone donates land and you're like, okay, or is it like, and what is that first step? Is it hey, we need a board, <laughs> or just kind of curious about those first steps? This is actually a really great question too. Thank you so much for asking that. So currently on our website, brand new, you can go online and fill out start your own agrarian commons, and that has all of the information that you need. You could just go look at it before you're actually ready to fill it out and see the types of questions it's asking. And before you even fill it out, it says, here's what you need. So that is all like really well laid out on the website too. And we're like super interested in hearing from the people who are interested in doing that. So in Tennessee, we just have a middle Tennessee agrarian commons and that board and the bylaws have already decided that they're gonna focus strictly on middle Tennessee. But yeah, if there's someone in East Tennessee who's interested, go fill out a start in agrarian commons. We'd love to hear from you. Cool. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much. One other thing I wanted to kind of put out there. So, you know, as we're having these discussions, this is our second land access discussion. The first one was focused uh, um, very much on the federal aspects of like the farm bill and how that and what National Young Farmers Coalition is doing to um, push this one million acres campaign. Um, but our chapter is very interested on about state policy and what we can do on a state level. Um, and so I kind of want to just put that out there to folks out there in the audience and also online or wherever. Um, you know, there have been states that have passed tax incentive laws um, that help out people who transfer, their, you know, give tax breaks to people who transfer their land to young and beginning farmers. Um, and that's something that <laughs> Emma and I were like, we need to do that. And then we were like, oh, Tennessee doesn't have income tax. Like how, where does that where does that benefit come in and how does that work? And so you know we've kind of put it, that question out to some lawmakers and folks. But if you happen to know the answer to that or maybe have some ideas, we would love you know just kind of putting that information out there for folks to be thinking about um, how can we in Tennessee be 
you know, using policy to address these issues. And also, I'm curious, like as our chapter, you know, I want you guys to be thinking as members of our chapter, like how can we be helping agrarian trust? Um, certainly they're a resource on our website, but they're doing a lot of this work, access work on the ground. And so like, we wanna make sure that we're working with y'all and how can we, you know, get that working? So anyway, I wanted to say that. Are there any other like questions, comments? Hi, Emily. We can talk through it or say that. Yeah. Um, so thank you guys. What we'll do, I think, is um, if everyone wants to step aside and breathe and you know, we'll turn the fans back on in here. Um, but we'll take maybe the next 10 minutes to just set food along the back counter. Um, and if we need to use that middle table, that's fine too. Um, I don't know if there's 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 an oven going outside if people need to reheat stuff. Um, if you have cold stuff, it can just go along the table and then we'll like make some kind of noise to let people know that <laughs> food's ready and we can go ahead and eat. And so far so good with it not raining outside. So. And y'all can take chairs outside to the table.